Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast, where we look forward to shaving every day. Welcome to episode 129 of the podcast. My name is Rick DeWeese. I'll be your host this week. All right, we start off this week with a uh, shave of the day. Then we go over to Sharpologist for a quick uh, blog on the curse and confusion from the cartridge razor. A well-written blog if I've ever seen one. A Saturday shave of the day. Now, you may have noticed, you may have seen it over on uh, on Facebook or Twitter or even on Kickstarter. Rockwell is back with uh, with something special. They uh, they have a uh, a new razor that they're coming out with. So uh, we'll talk about that. Links will be in the show notes. Then we'll go back to uh, Sharpologist because Mantic 59, and how he does this, I don't know. He's got connections. He got one of the prototype versions of the uh, Rockwell razor, the new one. And uh, he gives you a little bit of uh, feedback on what he thought of it. So good stuff. Do a, a sh- another shave of the day. We uh, we had a good scout meeting the other night. We did uh, we did knots, and we did left handed stuff. I'll tell you all about that. Might make you think a little bit. <laughs> I found a really good fa- uh, a really good uh, video on Facebook, and uh, I've posted it in the show notes. It's hard to describe, uh, you know, for audio. But if you go to the show notes or go to the blog and click on it, uh, you can get to it. But it's how to fold a suit. And uh, I thought it was really, really interesting. I I go into some just short outtakes, not something you see every day. (laughs) It always happens, and (laughs) yeah, we're in trouble. (laughs) Uh, Do a a final Wednesday shave of the day. Uh, How do you approach your day? Um, You know, some people walk out the door with a certain attitude, and some people walk out the door with a different attitude. What attitude do you walk out the door with? How do you approach your day? And uh, are you approaching your day in a way that, well, puts it uh, in the best situation possible for you? And then finally, I had somebody ask me, how long does it take you to do the podcast? So I figured I'd do a, a quick blurb on, uh, well, how long it actually takes. Anyhow, that's the show this week. Let's get on with this thing. All right, let's uh, let's talk about the shave of the day. It's a nice morning out here. It's about 64 degrees or so. Although the pollen is just amazing right now. It is, uh, my blue truck is green. <laughs> and I have to wash my windshield to get the pollen off of it so I can see. <laughs> Anyhow, the shave of the day. Okay, let's start off with the shave of the day yesterday. So I wanted to do something different, something I hadn't done in a while, and so I went ahead and picked up one of my single-edged razors and uh, one of my injector razors. I haven't done any injectors in a while, and the one that I happened to pick up was my Pal Injectomatic. Now, I put a brand new Schick blade in it. The Schick blades you can still get for about four or five bucks for uh for you know one of the little uh, dispensers. I think there's seven blades in those things. And uh, so I had a nice sharp blade in it. Love the little Schick injector, or not the or the PAL injector. Uh, really, really nice. Although I, I have to admit, I have a tendency to really like all of my injector razors with the exception of one that has a loose handle. And I don't know if somebody dropped it or what, but it just doesn't, it, it doesn't work well. Um, but the rest of them? Yeah, they're nice little razors, and it's one of those things that I, I've often wondered about is, how did we get away from these? Because they work well. Obviously, the patent ran out. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I went ahead and used my uh, my Samog 1305 back in action and uh, Smog brush, so that was nice. Again, just trying to Trying to give it some 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 workouts, if you will, to uh, make sure that the glue holds and everything's good with it. I used a soap that I haven't used in a while, and that is Ginger's Garden or Ginger's Garden Enigma. And uh, I I had a I have a puck of that soap, a tin of that soap, and I haven't used that in a long, long time. And I love, absolutely love the smell of it. So. Went ahead and lathered it up. Beautiful, beautiful lather. Oh my gosh, you know, just almost not quite effortless, but pretty close. 
Um, really, really great lather. Lathered up, shaved, first pass. I started noticing a little bit of sensitivity, and I'm thinking, okay, is it the razor, is it the soap? When the soap was off, didn't have a problem. Soap went back on, had a little sensitivity. Hmm, okay, maybe it's just me. Anyhow, the shave of the day went great and uh, yesterday and proceeded to, uh, to to head off to work and uh, no aftershave or anything and just it was really, really nice. So all in all, good stuff. So let's fast forward. Well, maybe not fast forward. How about let's forward to uh, today's shave of the day. Today's shave of the day, I used again the Enigma soap and my uh, my pal Injectomatic. And this time I used my fine brush, synthetic brush. It loaded beautifully, created an absolutely beautiful lather. In fact, the picture that I'm I'm posting for this one, uh, that's the lather that is left after a three-pass shave with touch-up. Amazing. Just amazing. So, of course, the brush is doing well, and, and the, the, the razor is uh, doing beautifully. But, again, a touch of sensitivity with the Enigma soap. So I get to looking because now, okay, I'm curious. It's not me. It's just, you know, and, and I haven't used this soap in a while. And, and I don't recall quite the same level of sensitivity. So I happened to look at the, on the uh, Ginger's Garden site. And uh, so this soap contains a blend of the following fragrance oils. <laughs> Pine, cedar, amber, sandalwood. Aha, uh-huh. there it is. Okay. I am sensitive to sandalwood. I always have been, and it's a shame because I absolutely adore, adore the sandalwood smell. So anyhow, the Enigma. Okay, the Enigma soap. Pine, cedar, amber, sandalwood, patchouli, vanilla, uh, as long as notes of marshmallow, musk, brown sugar, and coconut. Wow. Yeah, good stuff. And the thing is, is that it 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 changes. <laughs> and that for for the most part that's for me anyhow why the the name is so fitting. The uh the smell changes. It changes a little bit over time, changes as you use it. It smells differently in puck format than it does after you create a lather. I mean it's just it, it really is fascinating. And uh there are so many smells going on all at the same time and they're very beautifully balanced. They they truly are. And the smell stays with you. I mean, it's one of those soaps that the uh, that the smell stays with you. So you know, even without an aftershave, you still get wafts of uh, of fragrance every now and then. So, really, really good stuff. Anyhow, that is the shave of the day. It's a it's a beautiful day, a good Friday, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the day because uh, I got the weekend off, and uh, I'm gonna take Monday off as well. Just well because. So uh, there you go. Hopefully you are having an exceptional day as well. Another great blog post at Sharpologist. Curse and confusion from the cartridge razors. This was posted by Doug. says, the multi-bladed shaving instrument from the original Track 2 all the way up to the most recent seven-bladed designs, some with their spring, pivoting suspension systems like Italian sports cars, allow wet shavers to do three things that hinder their technique when switching back to razors of earlier eras. I list these three hindrances below in their order of importance. Shavers can firmly press with multi-bladed razor against the face with virtual impunity. Shavers can shave with the multi-bladed razors using very rapid strokes. In fact, the multi-blade design encourages rapid strokes because that's when the hysteresis of the multi-blade design is most effective. And shavers generally learn only to shave with the grain of the beard when using the multi-blade disposables. And he goes on talking about the problem of pressure and the fact that, well, when you have one of these cartridge razors, you can put down um, a lot of pressure on the head of the razor, whereas with a traditional design, double-edge, single-edge, injector, um, pressure is not necessarily a good thing. 
He also goes on to say that uh, speed, speed kills, except, well, the multi-bladed razors are actually de- designed to be used quickly and fast. Hmm, there's something that we got to get over, huh? So between the pressure and the speed, there are two things to bad habits, if you will, that we have to unlearn. And then finally, the gravity of grain. And he is exactly right. When you're using uh, the multi-bladed cartridges, you typically don't think about grain. Whereas when you're using a single-bladed bladed instrument, or you know, be it double-edged or single-edged, injector, whatever, um, you do take into account which direction grain goes. Anyhow, I thought it was really, really a good and well-written article and really lays out some of the issues that people can have when switching from a cartridge razor to a traditional razor or even switching back. Um, You know, sometimes we do that just in the course of experimentation and if we don't get the the results that we desired, no matter which way we go, well, maybe this little blog post will have some of the secrets as to why. Okay, so let's talk about the shave of the day. This was Saturday's shave of the day, and uh, so I soaked up my uh, Samog 1305 bore brush and uh, proceeded to bloom my uh, Enig- my Enigma soap from Ginger's Garden. Now, like I've said, the soap is excellent. It does an excellent job lathering, and uh, the only issue that I have, and it's unfortunate, it's not the soap's fault, it is my fault. Because my sin- skin, because my skin is sensitive to sandalwood. And uh, because of that, uh, I get a little irritation, a little burning sensation as the soap sits on my face for any length of time. Again, not the soap's fault, it's all me. Anyhow, so I, I you know, soaked the brush, bloomed the soap, jumped in the shower, got, got cleaned up and uh, everything prepped and proceeded to jump out and lather. Now, when I did that, what I did is something, well, just a little bit different. Usually what I'll do is I'll just take my brush and pull it out of the water and kind of shake, give it a good shake to uh, knock the majority of moisture off of it and then proceed to uh, load the soap. I'd been watching the Shaving Evangelist on YouTube and noticed that when he was loading with a synthetic brush, he squoze the water out of the brush so that it would load better. And I thought... I'll give that a try. So I did. I took the brush out of the water and uh, gave it a good squeeze to get the majority of the moisture out of the brush, dumped the, uh, w- the, the bloom water off of the soap, and proceeded to, uh, to load the brush up. And then I proceeded to lather in the old salsa bowl with a teaspoon of water. What I was greeted with was an extremely luxurious lather. I mean, it was probably half again as thick as what I have been achieving just doing it the way that I was doing it previously. So, thank you. I have learned something, you know. If you ever if you ever have anybody say that you can't teach an old dog a new trick, nah, all you got to do is get the uh, dog to actually pay attention. <laughs> so anyhow, um yeah. So I I'm getting a little bit better loading on the brush uh using that methodology and lo and behold get a beautiful, luxurious lather out of it. Uh, the the picture that I've posted uh, both, both on Instagram today and uh, the one that I'll put in the show notes uh, and on the blog is after a three-pass shave with some touch-up. And there is easily enough to... Uh, to do another uh, another couple of passes easily, perhaps even a complete shave there. Not a problem whatsoever. So I was surprised, to be quite honest, by the amount of soap that I was able to, uh, or the amount of lather that I was able to get. So with that said, and with the lather thickly applied, I proceeded to shave with my... Uh, with my PAL Injectomatic single-edged blade with a Schick blade in it. And what I did this go-round is I held the 
the razor, the handle of the razor, between my index finger and thumb and essentially allowed no pressure other than the blade itself, than the razor itself, to do any cutting uh, for the most part, and proceeded to do the first pass. And was happily surprised that uh, it did a very, very nice job with essentially no pressure whatsoever on the razor. Now, I must admit... Um, that took a little bit of concentration, and by the time I got to the second and third pass, I had kind of lost concentration, probably due to my short attention span. <laughs> Squirrel! <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I was. it was just a testament again that we need to let the razor do the cutting and not necessarily have uh, ourselves uh, apply pressure uh, extraordinaire to things to, uh, to, to make things cut. Um, so, anyhow, proceeded with, like I said, a three-pass shave and some touch-up. Wonderful, wonderful shave. No issues at all. One little nick down by the Adam's apple. It's like I, it happened so quick, didn't even realize it happened until I looked up after the shave and realized that there was just a spot of blood there. It's like, oops, well, okay. Um, not a big deal. Threw on some, uh, some brute after save. <laughs> Threw on some brute aftershave, and uh, yeah, all in all, good stuff. A good way to start the day, and uh, off we go to the races. Well, the big news out in the wet shaving community is Rockwell has come out with a new razor. And the, the, the great thing about it is that it is an adjustable razor. And not only is it an adjustable razor, but it is a twist-to-open silo door adjustable razor. Holy cow, one of these things hasn't been brought out to the public in, well, years, decades, <laughs> a long time. And it kind of goes hand-in-hand with, well, trying, <laughs> you know, it's it's one of these things that, that is really fascinating to me because I find, especially in in my everyday life, that unfortunately there is a large contingent of the population that just doesn't make any more. They don't do any more. They expect to find everything that they want on the Internet at the click of a mouse. And when they don't find it, they're stymied. They're stuck. They can't move forward. They just stop dead in their tracks. And it's really like, oh, well, I guess we won't do that. Okay. So one of the things that I like to do, uh, just because of my nature of not wanting to give up, is I will take what already exists and modify it to fit my needs. And... uh If that requires a little machine work, a little filing, a little cutting, a little, well, whatever, yeah, I'll do that and uh, walk away with a product that, well, fits my needs and uh, does the job and does the job well. So it's curious when I run into people that are not like that because I have a hard time, well, I don't know, understanding their frame of reference. I mean, anything's doable. You can you can accomplish anything that you set your mind to, given enough time and money. That is probably the truest statement that I have ever heard. The problem is, is that most people don't want to give any of their time, nor any of their money, to actually do something. It's one of the reasons that I like Kickstarter. Anyhow. The Rockwell Razor Company has come out with the Model T Razor. So they went out, they saw a need, they saw something that they could do to fit that need, and decided to make it. Now again, I have a soft spot in my heart that people that go out and make, and people that go out and do. So, yeah. I really like this. Now, the last time I saw the the Kickstarter was for, I can't remember the amount, but I was amazed at how many people had uh, actually uh, signed up for that particular Kickstarter because I believe they were fully funded already. And, uh, 
yeah, everything is uh, appears to be going very, very well. Now, if you followed the last Kickstarter campaign that Rockwell came out, um, Rockwell had some, some issues with the quality control and uh, what they learned, and it's a painful lesson, but what they learned is that they essentially had to have a hand in quality control of every single piece and aspect of what they were making and sending out to the public. So I feel pretty good after that lesson that was exceedingly painful for the guys over at Rockwell. I feel really, really good that they have taken that into account and are now ensuring that the Rockwell razor that they are producing or going to produce will in fact meet the quality control needs uh, that they are looking to achieve. I have no doubt that uh, after the pain and suffering and having to contribute essentially their financial fortunes to the, uh, to the last Rockwell uh, adventure, that they are probably not going to want to do that again. You know, it's one of those things, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, well, shame on me. I don't think you're going to have two of those types of issues with the Rockwell Razor Company. It's just my take on it. But uh, anyhow, I will link in the show notes to the uh, Kickstarter campaign of the Rockwell Model T. I wholeheartedly suggest that you go check it out, take a look at it, and if you uh, think that it's something you would like, uh, yeah, Throw some money behind their Kickstarter campaign. And let's, uh, let's give these guys a shot. Now, also up there on Sharpologist is uh, Mantix 59, a uh, quick evaluation of one of the prototypes for the Rockwell Model T adjustable razor. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in that and would like to know what somebody, well, like Mantic, has to say about it, um, you can click on the link in the show notes and uh, find out good stuff. Okay, so let's talk about the shave of the day. The shave of the day, again, was with uh, Ginger's Garden Enigma. Love that soap, but uh, yeah, it still has a bit of a reaction when it comes to the uh, to the sandalwood fragrance that's in it, and uh, so it does burn just a little bit, but that's okay because I continue to use it because I love the soap so much. <laughs> Sad but true. You know you're addicted to wet shaving and, and you're addicted to uh, sandalwood when even though it has issues, it burns, and uh, you have reactions to it, you continue to use it. Hmm. <laughs> so uh, lathered that up with, the, uh, with my Badger brush, my Nathan Clark Badger brush, and uh, proceeded to shave it off with my Pal Injectomatic, and uh, all good stuff, great shave, finished off with a little Pinot Clubman, and uh, didn't really have any issues. Now, I did notice that uh, I used as light a pressure, as light a weight as I could. You know, the other day I said that I had kind of had it just between my, uh, just between my fingertips, and I was just using the weight of the head for, the, uh, for that injector razor. And being an injector razor, there's hardly any weight at all. And uh, I was still able to uh, produce just an absolutely fine BBS shave. And, uh, yeah, good stuff. Really, uh, really did a nice job. I was actually very, very impressed. One little weeper, but uh, not too bad. And uh, other than that, that's, uh, and, and I don't know if that's more of a, of an issue of just a slight, I don't know, breaking out, if you will, from reaction to the sandalwood or what. So I, I can't necessarily blame the razor for that. Uh, probably more a reaction to the soap. But, boy, the soap just lathers up fabulously. It just really does a great job. And, uh, yeah, 
Really pleased with that. Went and uh, threw that in my electric scuttle this morning. It's a little bit uh, cooler out this morning, so uh, really nice job there. And uh, I found it's a lot easier in my electric scuttle than in my old uh, do-it-yourself scuttle. You know, way back when I had a, a salsa bowl and a berry bowl, and I was uh, had a little do-it-yourself scuttle and put the two together, fill them up with hot water, and uh, it would keep things going pretty nicely. But you know, using the uh, electric uh, warming plate, the Mr. Coffee warming plate, on a uh, on essentially what is a big hand-thrown soup bowl, um, actually is just so much more convenient and gives a nice warm lather uh, that I really, really enjoy it. There's no mess. There's no uh, there's no extra water. Uh, it's real easy to clean up and clean out. It's not a big issue. So uh, yeah, so far a real good shave, real good start to the day. Well, we had a good scout meeting the other night. It was actually rather instructive. First off, <laughs> when you uh, have a scout meeting that is uh, coinciding with the normal areas of spring break, don't expect too many people. <laughs> but at the same time, you know that the ones that show up are the ones that are dedicated. So uh, good job to them. The other thing that was interesting is uh, we were practicing knots. And while someone may know and understand how to tie a knot, they don't necessarily know how to use it. <laughs> For example, there is a knot called a bowline, and a bowline knot is a safety knot because it kind of cinches up on itself and won't slip. And so you can tie one of those and not have to worry about it closing up or uh, you know, constricting a person or or whatever, and so that's one of the reasons that they use it as a uh, as a safety knot, as a rescue knot. Well, we also use them a a good bit to uh, to tie on to things and to uh, well, yeah, to do those kind of things. So y you teach a boy how to tie a bowline, and he's got this bowline in his hand, and he's been able to tie it successfully. And now give them a tarp and say, here, uh, attach that line to this tarp through this grommet using a bowlin. And that's where the fun begins. Because while he can tie a bowlin without any difficulty at all out in free space, putting the loop through something is enough of a change to just throw him. <laughs> so a little bit of practice is necessary. So, uh, yeah. So we proceeded to tie bowlins around outside safety cones and trucks and, and, you know, bumpers and light poles and signs. And yeah, we tied bowlins around just about everything. And then we proceeded to throw a couple of clove hitches all over things on a taut line hitch and two half hitches and yeah, all the common knots. The only one really that is missing that, uh, that I will more than likely teach them as well that for some reason is not in the uh, in the scout book, which is rather amazing because it is such a useful knot, is the trucker's hitch. And I do find it amazing that, that nobody knows or understands what a trucker's hitch is anymore. And, uh, yeah, hmm, interesting. Anyhow, yeah, it was, it was good. In fact, uh, we were going to tie up uh, one of the boys' uh, bumpers on the front of his truck and not tell him so that when he pulled out, he would pull out signs and everything else. But we decided to uh, forego that. One of the other uh, scouts was kind and let us know that that probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> uh, oh, we have a lot of fun. But, uh, yeah, so we did that and... The other thing that we did that was also interesting is we played a game of catch. Played a game of catch with a football. Now, all of my scouts are right-handed, so we played a game of catch with a football left-handed. It is amazing how much better you can get at throwing a football left-handed if you do it for a while. Um, but when you first start off, you can't do it. Or at least it's very difficult. Your aim is off. You can't spiral the thing. It's just miserable. However, it is, in fact, the great equalizer. <laughs> because most people that are right-handed have never exercised their left hand to allow them to throw a football. 
And uh, so it's one of those things where if you have kids that are really athletic or something like that, trying to play with kids that, well, maybe are not so much, put everybody on an even playing field and let everybody throw left-handed. It's uh, it's quite fun to watch. <laughs> now, the real challenge, of course, is that not only throwing the ball left-handed, but catching it left-handed and catching it with only one hand. Yeah, now we have fun. Now we've got footballs just kind of bouncing all over the place. Nobody knows how to catch them. Yeah, it's good stuff. It will definitely uh, work parts of your brain that are not normally worked. <laughs> all in all, good stuff. So uh, if you happen to have kids, um, you might want to try the old left-handed thing. Because, uh, yeah, sometimes it's surprising what they can learn. And one of the things that is good in that learning is they learn that, well, yes, indeed, they do, in fact, get better if they just get off their rear ends. Yeah, I almost said it. If they get off their rear ends and practice and try and do their best. Imagine that. I also found this video over on Facebook a while ago, and I thought that it was absolutely fantastic. It's something that we don't think of very often, or at least I don't think of it very often. However, when it's done improperly, it can have a big impact on our appearance and how we feel because it has to do with, well, something that we wear to attempt to look our best. That is a suit. And the video that I have here, which is a Facebook uh, video, so uh, when you click on the link, it'll take you to Facebook, and it'll take you to the video on how to fold and pack a suit. So he was at uh, a Beverly Hills uh, uh, shop today, or when he took the video, and there was a head tailor from Italy that was visiting, and he showed him how to fold a perfectly well, how to fold and pack a suit. And it's it's brilliant. It really is. And, uh, you know, when I look at this, I think, okay, that could save a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of muss and fuss. And, you know, especially as we go and get our suitcases more toward the carry-on size to uh, be able to bring them with us so that the uh, airlines don't lose our luggage, uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to put a suit in that small environment and have it uh, come out relatively unscathed? So I thought it was a great thing to share. I'll post it up in the show notes. Okay, that's something you don't see every day. <laughs> I drove past a house, and there is a red flag fluttering in the backyard. It's a red McDonald's flag with the golden arches on it. <laughs> Now, that is not something that you see every day. Why is it that whenever you're in a moving vehicle, and it doesn't matter if you're a driver or a passenger, but why is it whenever you're in a moving vehicle and raise coffee cup to lips, that that's when you hit a bump, have to step on the brakes, have to do something to essentially slosh coffee all over the dang place? Ugh. Goodness. I wonder why that is. Hmm. Maybe uh, <clears throat> Lucifer does not like coffee drinkers. Could be. Don't know. <laughs> oh, well. No harm, no foul. Just, well, frustration. <laughs> but it does give you something to wonder about. Why is that? How about this one? So I go past a CVS. <laughs> CVS Pharmacy sitting there, and they got the drive-up pharmacy window. There it is, right there. <laughs> and right before the drive-up pharmacy window is the drive-up ATM machine. Man, does that not send a good signal. <laughs> Holy cow. You know, and you see something like that, and you think, okay, yeah, we're in trouble. Ah. <laughs> uh. All right, let's talk about the shave of the day. Well, first off, it's a beautiful Wednesday springtime morning. 
uh, doesn't seem the the pollen seems to be slowing down. I think I've washed my uh, my mobile studio here about four times in the last three weeks. At least rinsed it off or washed it off to uh, get the pollen off because the uh, the blue mobile studio was actually turning green <laughs> and looked pretty rough. So uh, it's it's dying down to a dull roar, but uh, everything is absolutely gorgeous. It's blooming. It's well, it's springtime. <laughs> Isn't that fabulous? And and the nice thing is is that it's been a spring without a freeze. You know, the last couple of springs we've had, it's been absolutely gorgeous, and then we've had a freeze to kill all the buds, to to you know just wipe everything out, and just and then nature's got to start all over again. Well, let's go around. There wasn't a start all over again because there wasn't a freeze. So it's absolutely beautiful out here. All the flowering trees are flowering. There's, you know, flowers just popping up all over the place. Uh, I mean, it's just, it it really is rather fantastic. So uh, anyhow, back to the shave of the day. The shave of the day today was, well, probably the last shave I'll do for a while. I'll put it back in the... uh, back in the stash and uh, let it collect dust, I suppose, of the Enigma Soap from Ginger's Garden. Wonderful soap, wonderful lathering. uh, Just one of the things that I have noticed, however, is that uh, I have increased my capability for loading, and I, at least with that soap, got much thicker lathers by blooming and by uh, knocking off a little bit more of the water that was on the brush before I started loading. And uh, that has significantly increased the uh, the thickness of my lathers. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting and, well, dare say exciting to uh, to go forward to see what my soaps that I thought were really good latherers, what they will be able to do if uh, if I use the same methodology on them. So the uh, the razors that I used, and I did use two, one was my Case Straight Razor, and uh, just kind of did uh, three-pass shave with that, and then touched up with my uh, with my PAL Injectomatic. Well, a great combination, you know, I mean, you still get the, the, you know, almost straight razor feel, you know, with the single edge, but you can go very easily against the grain, under the nose, under the lip, you know, around the chin. Uh, very easy, comfortable, and uh, and and nice without uh, without the well potential hazards of uh, doing so with a straight razor. Now, yes, I can do it with straight razor, but uh, yeah, there are potential hazards with doing such. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is, you know. I, yeah, when I walk on water, my feet get wet. So uh, yeah. Anyhow. <laughs> Finished up um, with a last of my uh, How to Grow Mustache Bay Rum Aftershave, the one with the alum in it, and uh, the one that the wife doesn't like. And uh, I could have gone without, but uh, I just felt like a Bay Rum and wanted to finish up what I had. Wife had left early, so uh, knew I wasn't going to get complained at because, oh my gosh, what's that, you know. <laughs> uh, other than that, things are just great here in paradise, but uh, if I could only get the wife to actually like Bay Rum. Oh, well. Anyhow, good shave, you know, BBS for the most part, uh, you know, very, very nice, very easy to touch up, fairly quick. I mean, you know, you hit the high spots with the straight and then touch up with the single-edged injector, and uh, yeah, all is good. Anyhow, that's the shave of the day. So when you start out in the morning, when you start your day, do you start with an attitude that you are going to reclaim your day? Or are you going at it with an attitude of, I'll take it as it comes, and I can't do anything about it? Don't be the victim. (laughs) You have the ability to reclaim your day every single day that you walk out of the house. And it starts, of course, with your shave. And with your morning routine, you know, it it starts with the attitude that you wake up with, the attitude that you walk out the door with. 
And if you walk out the door with an attitude of, okay, I got this. This is mine. I am going to mold it and shape it the way that, well, I want to mold it and shape it. Not the way somebody else does. You know, there's a lot of people that, that when they when they talk and they've had bad experiences, they said, well, well, this person made me. No, that person never made you. You allowed yourself to react in a fashion. You know, I mean, even if somebody comes in and says, you must do this, it's still your choice. <laughs> you have the ability to reclaim your day, to recapture the day, to make it yours. Are you doing that? Or are you just sitting back and saying, well, I'll take it as it comes and react to it as it happens? Hmm. You know, a lot of times in, in businesses, what we talk about is being proactive instead of reactive. You know, reactive is always a bad thing because it typically happens after something bad has already happened and you're reacting to it. You know, that's why they, they look for things like leading indicators. <laughs> You know, they look for indicators that tell them about a problem well before it happens. And so the question is, is that are there problems in your life and, and you know, that you are reacting to? And do you have an opportunity to get ahead of them? Do you have an opportunity to make changes in what you do or how you react or whatever so that you head off problems before they occur? In other words, you have a proactive stance in your life. You, you do what needs to be done, well, before it needs to be done, because you want to get ahead of the game. You want to get ahead of the problems. You want to get under the ball that is dropping out of the sky before it, you know, with your glove, before it hits you in the head. <laughs> that is probably the best analogy I have ever heard. A person told me one time there's a difference between reaction and proaction. Reaction is you stand out in the outfield and the ball drops out of the sky and hits you out just right in the head and you fall down and yell and rub your head. Proaction is actually raising your hand with the glove to catch the ball. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. So do you go out of the door every morning with the idea that you are going to be proactive in everything that you do, if at all possible? to reclaim your own destiny, to reclaim your life, to make it what you want it to be instead of what somebody else wants it to be? It's a good question. I know I do. I start off with a shave. I start off with the opportunity to be clean and neat, and this is the way that I'm going to approach the world to, to set the mood, if you will, of I'm in charge whether that's with a double-edged razor or a straight razor. Because I'm here to tell you, there is something about using a straight razor that lets you walk out of the house with the attitude of, I got this, what do you got? I shaved with a straight razor this morning. What'd you use? Cartridge? <laughs> Somebody asked me, how long does it take to do your podcast? And so, after giving it a bit of thought, this is my response to that question. Okay, so every morning I walk out of the house, usually with a cup of coffee and an absolutely great attitude, because I have a very nice shave and sometimes a really good aftershave, or sometimes the soap can just carry its own. Anyhow, I walk out of the door and I jump into the truck. I jump into my mobile studio. Now, the reason that I have the mobile studio is because I found, first off, it everything that I talk about happens in the morning. And if I record in the morning, it's very fresh and, and, and you know, near in my mind and I can grasp it. The other thing is that, well, you know, as most people are, as I drive to work, I'm alone in the vehicle, so... It doesn't really matter what I say, how I say it, how loud I get, how emotional I get, how passionate I get. I have the ability to do that. Nobody's going to look at me funny. Nobody's going to look at me strange. I don't have passengers in the car looking at me thinking, what the heck are you talking about? What are you doing? Or would you please be quiet? I'm trying to look at Facebook. <laughs> so I'm in the mobile studio driving down the road. 
I usually go to work in the same fashion, in the same way. I, I'm a I'm a person of routine to a certain extent, and and I like driving through the small town that I drive through to to get to work. It's uh, it's comforting. It's kind of got an old uh, old time feel to it, and I just well I enjoy it, and it allows me to. I mean, these people are neighbors. It allows me to see what well essentially is going on in the neighborhood, and so that's nice. Now, my my trip to uh to work takes me I uh, call it 25 minutes. And in those 25 minutes, I can record a shave of the day segment and a segment on thoughts and well, a segment like this for example, and they usually take me 5 to 10 minutes. And so I have 5 to 10 minutes every day, but it's it's time that would normally be used listening to another podcast, listening to the radio, you know, talking on the phone, doing whatever. And to a certain extent, it's it's time I'm recapturing because it would be used to, well, do not much of anything except sit here and, you know, just watch. Watch life go by. And I don't want life to go by. I want to grab it by the throat, <laughs> as I have stated before. So anyhow, once I get all of my uh, all of my recordings done for the week in the mobile studio on uh, on Wednesday evening, I will I will take out the SD card out of my digital recorder here in the mobile studio and uh, take it into the house. There is some editing that I need to do and some uh, post production work, uh, getting rid of uh, you know minor noises, equalizing it a bit to make it sound well just a little less tinny. And uh, no matter what I do, uh, the the microphone that I have um, in the in the truck, it's a it's a great microphone. It's a little dynamic microphone, so you don't hear all the road noises or things happening on outside or you know stuff like that. It's it's fairly good at isolating well just me. And uh, so you know, but it doesn't have the full, thick, rich sound that my studio mics have. And uh, they're also, you know, this one is also not going through a, an amplifier or an equalizer to give it a little extra boost either. So I equalize a little bit to get a waveform that is as close as I can manage to uh, to, to getting um, to the to the studio mic. So there is that bit of editing. There's there's normalizing. There's you know getting the the levels right and things like that. And, and making sure things are not uh, just all over the place from the sound level standpoint, because otherwise it's impossible to listen to. There was a podcaster uh, not too long ago that, well, probably about a year and a half ago, that I used to really, really enjoy listening to, but he never, he would have different levels in each segment. Each segment was a different volume, and you'd find yourself, you know, on the headphones, turning up and down the volume in each segment, and it it was just, it was annoying. It was, you know... It was terrible, and I contacted him, and I said, hey, you know, this is what's going on. What's up? And it turns out that uh, he admitted that he was hard of hearing, and uh, he didn't really know how to look at his level meter to, to make sure things were even. And So, I, you know, I dropped it there. I said, well, you know, he's got the feedback. He can do with it what he wants, and I unsubscribed because I couldn't listen to it. So I, because of that, I attempt to, to level things out, and that takes... Uh, for a week's worth of segments off of the uh, off of the SD card, you're probably looking at uh, maybe an hour there. I then look for uh, you know anything that I've saved, um, emails, uh, comments, letters, uh, stuff coming in, stuff off of the the web that is interesting. You know whatever's going on at uh, various uh, forums, posts, whatever that. Uh, that strike my fancy, strike my interest, and I will record those on the uh, on the studio mics, and uh, that usually takes me uh, call it an hour to an hour and a half, somewhere in that neighborhood. So then, at that point, um, it's just piecing together the show, putting putting the uh, the audio bumpers in, and and things like that, the intros, the outros. Uh, finally adjusting all the levels, doing all that. That t- takes, I don't know, call it a half an hour. And uh, then at the end of it, um, you know, while it's uh, converting over to an MP3, I take all that information, 
shove it into the blog post and uh, proceed to import any pictures. And usually about the time I'm done with that is about the time it's done converting over to an MP3 for an hour-long show or thereabouts. And then what I'll do is I'll copy everything that I have in the blog post, dump it over into Libsyn, copy the... Uh, copy the mp3 file over to Libsyn so it has something to uh, to populate iTunes with. And uh, by the time I'm walking away with it, the, the actual studio session of editing and everything like that takes, I eh, call it three and a half hours. Three and a half, maybe four hours, depending on what I get into. So we'll call it four hours at the outside. But it, it keeps me off the streets and it's something to do. And in fact, if I'm not doing it, my wife has gotten to the point where she actually nags me on Wednesdays to, uh, you know, you better get upstairs. You got a podcast to do, <laughs> which I find just absolutely hilarious. <laughs> uh, you know, at first she thought I was crazy. Then she thought it was kind of cool. Now she's nagging me to to go do it. So apparently she's figured out that this is my job or something. <laughs> I just get a kick out of that. So. You know, when it's all said and done, um, the the auditing, auditing, the uh, editing and, and audio stuff and, and getting everything, you know, call it four hours at the outside and and the um, the actual recording of the of the segments, you're probably looking at oh I don't know fifteen twenty minutes a day. I call it fifteen minutes a day just for an average. Um, because it's not all days that I'll do a, a longer segment like this. You know, it's only mainly just shaves of the day and things like that. So if you're interested in doing a podcast, you know, uh, d depending on what it is, there are some people that say, well, you should just do a podcast, you know, in order to make it as quick as possible, you should do a podcast in just one fling, you know, just, just record the whole thing, dump the music in at the same time, and, you know, just it is what it is, boom, you're done. Okay, well, that would work great, but I'm trying to record my reflections on a daily basis as to, well, what my shave of the day was. Kind of hard to do it after a week's gone by. I wouldn't probably have remembered that I was feeling a little irritation from the sandalwood oil that is in the Enigma soap, or that this particular razor blade was just a tad rough, or this particular aftershave had just a little bit more alcohol in it and had a little bit more of a sting that uh, you would normally associate with alcohol. Those kind of nuances and things, which are, well, rather important, I would think, get lost in the in in time because they just it's not right there in the moment. And so it depends on what you're trying to do and the format of what you're trying to do within a podcast if you care to do one. If you're talking about a TV show for example, yeah, you could probably sit down and do that in one fell swoop. Probably talk for half an hour about your experience uh and what you thought of and where you think the uh, the series is going or something like that, yeah, you could probably do that. Politics, you know, you, you could probably sit down and talk for a half an hour every show or an hour every show, uh, just, well, at least I could, <laughs> nonstop about politics and the nuances of it and, you know, the, the if, it's, if this is happening because of this or that, you know, I mean, yeah, you could probably do that in one fell swoop. And if you did that, and if you did that with decent studio mics, you may be able to whip out a podcast in uh, two hours. You know, it's uh, it wouldn't be that bad. You know, there's little tricks uh, when you when you're recording a podcast, for example. If you mess up, put a pause in and then snap your fingers or cough or do something that when you look at the waveforms, it's very noticeable. So you know that there's an issue there that you need to clean up. Uh, that way it's really easy to find and you can spend your time cleaning up instead of searching and re-listening to everything. I used to listen to all my podcasts from start to finish and sometimes I'll listen to my segments depending on how they're, how they, they're, they've been going. Um, I don't do that as much anymore because I know, for example, that uh, I, I have, I don't know, I guess I'm better at just speaking into the microphone without messing up. It just comes with time, I guess, but uh, typically I don't listen to the whole podcast. I'll listen to the beginning of a segment, the end of a segment, just to get the timing right and be able to put things in where they need to go and yeah, I kind of call it a day. But yeah, you could probably put out a podcast in about two hours. So the other thing that's interesting that 
is probably the hardest thing for podcasting that I've ever done is interviews. Not because the, the interview itself is difficult. That, for me, is the easy part. I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy asking questions. But the logistics of finding a time when I'm available and the other person's available and getting a good connection and doing all that, holy cow, what a time commitment that is. <laughs> the logistics of it are just wow. And, uh, you know, I find that 7.30, or 7 .30 to 8 o'clock in the morning is uh, while I'm driving to work is probably not a convenient time for most people to uh, take a Skype call or something like that. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoy uh, interviews. I, I really do. But if you're if you're thinking about doing an interview show, uh, there's that to consider as well. Are you available typically when other people are available, and uh, the logistics behind it? And yeah, there's a there's a bit to do there. So, like I said, some you know people have asked me how long it takes to do the podcast, and uh, there you go. That's uh, that's kind of the way it is. Now, it didn't used to be quite as easy. It uh, used to take me a little bit longer. I used to actually sit in my uh, in my <coughs> studio, my, my office in other words, uh, with the microphone in front of me after every morning shave to record the segments. And Actually, I used to type them up after, after I shaved or whatever and uh, do that in the blog post and then record them at a later date based on the notes that I took. I've tried taking notes in the in the bathroom to uh, to do it that way, and the best thing that I've found is just talk about it pretty close to immediately afterwards. So I don't know, maybe it's just me, but uh, I enjoy it a lot more. I find that uh, I can reflect and and think about things a lot easier, and so uh, yeah, that's just the way I do it. Anyhow, if you uh, if you would like to do, if you're thinking about doing a podcast or uh, want some more information, gear I use, or, or stuff like that, just give me a shout, type me an email. I'd be happy to help you out. It's not at all difficult. It's, uh, it's fairly easy. I do have a little bit of experience at this point with uh, different, <laughs> different providers for, uh, for podcast hosting and things like that. And I can warn you about some of the, uh, some of the issues that could, uh, that could crop up. Some of the things that I would suggest for uh, for your initial iTunes uh, stuff, if you go in that route, Stitcher and things like that. So uh, anyhow, if you'd uh, if you're interested in that, give me a shout. Well, that concludes this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you have some suggestions or would like a topic covered, drop me an email at brushandsoapandblade at gmail.com or give me a call at 864-372-6234 or contact us on Twitter at Brush and Blade. You can also visit us at our blog, brushandsoapandblade.wordpress.com. As always, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher. 